Hey, thanks for tuning in. Awesome. All right, you got me? Yeah. All right, cool. So let's do this. I'm currently at my mom's house, and there's this weird photo in the background. So I'm going, it kinda, I'm missing it around. Adds a what? different uh, different feel to this one, huh? Yeah, my background is definitely not as nice as your background. You got a cooler little background going than I do. There's, there's a pretty cool story to this background, actually. I'm in a room that has all of Dr. Curlin's memorabilia. So the uh, Curlin Job Institute, obviously. Um, Dr. Curlin was uh, trained and uh, was at USC for a long time. And so we have all kinds of fantastic memorabilia uh, from Dr. That's Curlin. Awesome. So signed jerseys, things from the racetrack. He, he was a big supporter of the jockeys and took care of a lot of uh, the jockeys. So. There's a lot of really cool stuff in this room, uh, which is related to Dr. So where are you? Are you at Verdugo Hills or no? No, I'm at, uh, I'm at USC right now at CAC. At uh, CAC? Okay. In our CAC office, yeah. Nice. All right, so thanks for everyone that tuned in. Uh, if anything, you just heard about a really cool office that uh, Dr. Alex Weber is in right now. Um, so let's just start with introducing him. So uh, Dr. Weber, introduce yourself. And then we'll get started. Uh, we'll get started from there. Cool. So I'm a orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist at USC. Um, as part of my job here, I take care of patients in the community, do a lot of surgery, um, take care of the USC athletes, do some uh, some stuff shoulder related, some knee, uh, in the lab, uh, looking at basic science, rat models of arthritis. Some of it is on patients that we operate on. We see how they do postoperatively compared to preoperatively. Um, and then I take care of the USC athletes with a couple of my partners. So we're over at uh, the undergrad campus uh, at sporting events uh, constantly, just trying to keep our athletes as health healthy as possible. In terms of where I came from prior to USC, uh, I did my training at University of Michigan uh, for orthopedic surgery. And then uh, uh, from there, I went to Chicago for a year where I worked at Rush as a sports medicine fellow. Uh, at Rush, we took care of the Bulls and the White Sox. Um, and uh, then I came out here out west. So here I am. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, actually, Mike is going to be doing a, uh, an Instagram, uh, Instagram Live with a couple docs from Rush next week. Oh, perfect. So, Who's small world. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to mispronounce anyone's names incorrectly. Um, let me see. Yeah, sports I'll pull guy. It up real fast. Yeah, it's um, crap. Let me. I'm sure I could find it while we're going. Once you get started with something, but um, or what's that? Is it Cole Brian Cole? Or... And maybe him. It's gonna be two Brian. guys. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, we're gonna talk a little bit about like PRP stuff next Monday. I just don't want to mispronounce anyone's name. I could always pull it up on my phone. You got to find it, yeah. Yeah, for sure. We'll figure it out by the end. Um, and then a little bit about how you and I know one another. So I'm a practicing physical therapist for Aspire Physical Therapy and Sports Performance located in La Cañada in Glendale. And mm -hmm. that's how Dr. Weber and I, we first met uh, because Dr. Weber refers patients to us there. And then we just sort of built a little relationship. And now here here we are today um and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh the biceps and the labrum and then sounds like maybe you have uh one of your patients or someone in here uh but it's uh the galen crew says hi ah the galen crew is all of our uh, court sports so USC, oh nice men's and women's uh volleyball uh and men's and women's basketball and beach volleyball and that looks like jenna adams who's one of our uh usc uh, women's volleyball players Oh, That's awesome. The specialist. Nice. All right, cool. So we're going to get started right into it. Uh, like I said, the title is All Things Shoulder, Labrum, and Biceps. So, Dr. Weber, please give us a little intro about this specific anatomy. Uh, break it down for someone that maybe has no idea what this is. Sure. So the shoulder joint uh, is one of the coolest joints, I think, in our body. It is our most mobile of our major joints which is uh, really important. So in order to maintain that motion uh, in such a major joint, we have to uh, really uh, focus on the soft tissue ability of the joint too. Uh, so there's a trade-off. The more mobile a joint is, uh, the more likely it could get injured because 
order to have that motion, you're losing some restraint or constriction of the joint. So there's always this fine balance and probably the shoulder is the best example of that. We see it frequently in our uh, overhead throwing athletes, uh, overuse injuries, et cetera, because the shoulder just takes on such a tremendous load while also allowing you to move through space. So uh, the shoulder is a really challenging joint, I think, uh, because of how mobile it is. Um, it's also a great joint to treat because we see basically all spectrums of disorders. So we see young athletes with uh, traumatic injuries. We see clavicle fractures from falls, AC joint uh, We see uh, uh, proximal humerus fractures. Um, and uh, we see rotator cuff tears in the older population. So we really get the whole spectrum of uh, injuries. Today we're going to talk about uh, labrum and biceps. So I'll just jump right into the anatomy a little bit. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the labrum, I have a small model here. Uh, so this model is basically uh, looking at a right shoulder. So uh, here's the model uh, for everyone to see. Uh, so the shoulder joint is a ball in the socket. So the ball uh, or humeral head is here. Uh, the socket is here. All right. This is obviously a nicked up little model. We've used this a lot in the office, which is why it looks like this. Uh, but that's the shoulder joint, ball and socket, and all the brown that you see around it. These are some of the ligaments which help keep uh, the ball in the socket. The most important uh, uh, structure to keep the ball in the socket or keep compression of the joint is the labrum. And the labrum is a soft tissue or fibrocartilaginous structure which sits all the way around the socket. So circumferentially around the socket, uh, we have the labrum. And I have an old school uh, uh, model here or picture which I'll show you guys. This is really uh, kicking it old school, but let's see if you guys can see this here. So this picture right here is like a face-on view uh, of, uh, of the labrum. So you can see the labrum circumferentially sits around the socket or glenoid, okay? And I would people... say even, uh, you could even probably bring it closer. I'll tell you what, yeah. it. there you go. I think that'll be good for people to be able to see. Cool. So you can see here, this is a, a face-on view of the socket. So that's the glenoid. And circumferentially sitting around it is the labrum. So the labrum is a fibrocartilaginous structure. And what it does is help deepen the socket, helps keep the ball on the socket, uh, and also stabilizes uh, the joint or compresses the joint. And one interesting thing is that we often, you hear everyone say ball and socket joint the shoulder, but probably the best analogy I've ever heard is that it's more like a golf ball on a golf tee. So there's not a lot of restraint to the joint. And the reason it's like that is um, so that we can have all the motion with overhead activity, with throwing, with playing sports. We need that motion. And in order to get that motion, we sacrifice some of the stability. So I think the golf ball is probably the best analogy, golf ball on the golf tee for those who golf out there is much better analogy than a ball in the socket because it's not really a deep socket and the labrum is really important for providing some of that stability. Okay. Yeah, I love the golf ball and the tee analogy because then people understand how big the golf ball is compared to the tee. And that's yeah. why there's inherent instability to the joint itself. And then if there's any insult to some of those passive structures that we're going to get into a little bit, the, the labrum itself, then people really understand, oh boy. So it's like, well, how do we keep that golf ball on the tee? That's probably right. the hands down the best anal analogy there is. Right, and, and so just going through some of the basic anatomy here, we talked about, um, let me grab the other model. Here. We, talk, we talked about um, ball and socket. So uh, humeral head, ball. Uh, we talked about uh, socket, glenoid. Uh, this prominence of bone comes off of the scapula or shoulder blade. That's called the coracoid. You can, if you push on the front of your shoulder, you can feel the coracoid. And then we have the acromion, which comes, it's also uh, just part of the scapula. Uh, so it comes off the shoulder blade uh, and it comes around over top of the shoulder joint. And uh, it connects to the clavicle or collarbone. Um, so oftentimes we hear of quarterbacks, especially getting driven into the ground, landing directly on the shoulder. Uh, they often have what's called AC sprains uh, or separations of the acromioclavicular joint, AC joint. So that's the one up on top here, okay? So we have, again, a ball and socket, 
we have coracoid in the front, prominence of bone from the shoulder blade, which is in my left hand. And then we have uh, collarbone or clavicle coming to the acromioclavicular joint, or AC joint, uh, right here on top. Uh, and this is the orientation, uh, again, for a right shoulder, okay? Uh, so that's kind of the basic bony anatomy or osteology of, uh, of the shoulder. And then uh, we'll talk about labrum, uh, which sits on the circumferentially around the uh, glenoid socket. And then uh, I just want to point out the biceps, which we're also going to talk about. Here we only see the bones, but you can see this small groove that runs in front here. So let me see if you guys can see how there's kind of a groove in the front of the bone there. That's for uh, the biceps tendon as it comes up the arm. Uh, it's uh, down lower here. Um, but the uh, uh, biceps tendon comes through this groove and then makes kind of a hard turn as it comes into the joint and attaches up here uh, just uh, on the top of the lip. So again, I'm gonna go back to our uh, crazy old school uh, picture here. So probably the best, uh, tell me when we- uh, the That looks, yeah, even hold it, uh, move it, let me guess, a little bit up, just a tiny bit. Yeah, that's perfect there. Yeah. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have comments rolling in if it's not working. Cool. So this is like uh, uh, the glenoid cavity, and here's the labrum, right, circumferentially around it. And this is, again, that on-face view. So you can see the biceps tendon is this structure right here, which comes into the joint and attaches just on the top or the superior labrum. And we'll get into why that's such an important relationship between the biceps and the labrum, uh, because uh, we definitely uh, need to discuss how labral pathology and the biceps, especially the superior uh, labrum and the biceps go hand in hand. All right. Yeah, so I think we could probably jump right into that because sometimes even I have high schoolers come in or observers and not everyone always understands that intimate relationship between the yeah. biceps, long head tendon in the labrum. So why don't we talk a little bit about that, um, you know, when someone has a labral issue or a biceps issue, uh, how you explain that to the average person that you see in the clinic or a patient or even an athlete um, so that they can better understand that relationship. And then more importantly, how it all boils into the shoulder stability. Yeah. So we see a ton of uh, superior labral tears or slap tears. So superior labrum anterior to posterior. Uh, are the words that make up SLAP or the uh, mnemonic SLAP, uh, abbreviation, excuse me, SLAP, S-L-A-P. Um, so these are tears of the superior labrum at the biceps anchor or where the biceps anchor is. The way I talk to patients about these, uh, typically these are our throwing athletes, uh, our overhead hitting athletes, swinging athletes like volleyball players. Um, and the reason uh, these tears occur or why that's an intimate relationship between the biceps and the superior labrum is you can think about it this way, or the analogy I use is it's almost like the biceps tendon, the long head of the biceps tendon is like a leash on a dog's neck, okay? And so time you throw um, or hit a ball uh, in an overhead rapid fashion, there's angular velocity, a lot of force across the biceps and biceps tendon. And as the biceps contracts, the tendon pulls uh, on the labrum. So what that's doing, it's like if your dog starts wandering out of the way and you pull on the leash. Obviously, I don't uh, uh, advocate for people pulling hard on their dog's <laughs> neck. But what you can uh, imagine is every time you pull, uh, what happens is uh, the labrum feels some of that force or some of that pull from the biceps tendon. Uh, and that's what generates uh, the tears in the superior labrum. Uh, and I think kind of that uh, leash around a dog's neck is a good analogy for uh, what the forces are like on the superior labrum uh, when the bicep cracks. So what we see, uh, this is not always an acute injury, meaning it's not a one-time event. It's the uh, tennis player who serves over and over again the throwing athlete who's constantly throwing overhead, the volleyball player who's uh, spiking the ball uh, uh, all the time. These are the athletes who are sustaining these superior labral tears, uh, and it's in, in part due to um, uh, the biceps tendon. 
Yeah, and I think if anyone out there that's familiar with it, it's sort of that peelback mechanism. Uh, that's what it's commonly referred to, that pulling on it. Also, because you have that shoulder model there, I think it would be great to show the anterior and the posterior, right? It's understanding the, the glenoid fossa itself, imagining it as a clock from the lateral view, because I think that's a really easy way for people to understand that slap lesion. Yeah, so it's up on top here. This is the superior labrum would be sitting up here. Uh, anterior is front of the shoulder, so in this direction. Uh, posterior is back here in this direction. Um, so in, in this direction, superior labrum, anterior to posterior, this way. And then building right off of that, how would you, so other than the overhead athlete, uh, what have you seen just from practicing that are other ways that people commonly injure their labrum or the biceps? Yeah, so if we, if we want to focus just on, on labrum, for, um, we really have uh, labral injuries in two different categories. So um, we can talk about uh, anterior instability of the shoulder, posterior instability of the shoulder, labral tears are kind of the big three. Um, so those who injure their anterior labrum are typically doing so by a traumatic or dislocation of the shoulder. And that's typically with the arm in abduction and external rotation. So how I have my arm here and then an anterior directed force on the arm. So a force which then brings the arm forward. And you can imagine in this model, if the arm is out to the side, uh, like, and then an anterior force kind of pushes the ball uh, off the socket anteriorly. That's called the anterior dislocation. And what happens is as the ball kind of comes forward on the socket, this way, it knocks off uh, some of the labrum in, in the front of the shoulder here. Um, so as the ball kind of pushes forward, it knocks off the soft tissue on the front of the, of the uh, glenoid. And sometimes, and the reason this is all marked up is because sometimes that labrum comes off with some of the bone as well. Uh, and we call that a bony bankard injury. So if it's just labrum, soft tissue, it's called the soft tissue bank art. If the ball comes off the socket and knocks off some of the front bone here, that's called a bony bank art. So anterior instability is very common in our contact athletes, our younger contact athletes, that's football, rugby, uh, anything, uh, even basketball related, uh, soccer, uh, anyone who has the arm in this position and then has a force which pushes the arm forward uh, can sustain a uh, a dislocation of the shoulder. So that's anterior instability. That's one group of uh, labral injuries. Uh, and that's about, of all of the dislocations of the shoulder, anterior dislocations serve uh, between 95 and 98%. The other form of uh, labral tears are posterior uh, labral tears. And that's when uh, the arm is out in front of you uh, this way. So if you have your arm uh, fully out in front of you, internally rotated, uh, and then there's a posterior force on the arm. And you can imagine that, that position is somewhat like this. And then that force drives the ball out the back. So uh, from this uh, perspective, you can see the arms here. And then it's the, the ball is pushed out the back of the socket. This uh, is about uh, 2 to 5% of all dislocations. You can imagine people who are like this frequently are like offensive linemen in football uh, will sustain these injuries. Um, we also see it if, if a patient, unfortunately, has a seizure condition uh, or if they've been electrocuted, we'll see posterior dislocation. That will knock off or tear the posterior labrum, which is back here, okay? Uh, and sometimes also can remove bone as well uh, from either the ball or the socket. Uh, and that's a good uh, thing to mention now is in either direction, when, especially with the anterior dislocation, as the ball comes off the socket, uh, you can knock off bone from here, but you can also lodge the uh, ball and socket like this. The back of the ball gets caught on the front of the socket uh, as the shoulder comes out. And we refer to that uh, lesion in the back or that dimple in the back of the ball after such an injury as a hill sax injury. Um, so we see those frequently as well. So and then what is the, yeah, I was going to say, what do they refer to as the posterior dislocation commonly? 
um, refer to the posterior dislocation? Yeah, so like instead of a normal bank card, though, like uh, some questions came in, like uh, what exactly is a reverse bank card? Oh yeah, so if we have uh, we'll first the stacks uh, uh, or bony lead, so uh, number one, we can have uh, bony injuries off the back of the uh, glenoid, and also if, um, ball comes posteriorly, we can have what's called a reverse hill sacks lesion, which is when bone comes off the anterior aspect of the uh, ball side or humeral head. Um, it, so, and I, go ahead. I was going to say, I think all, all that's awesome because for a lot of individuals that they go and get an MRI and they get the results and then they're reading this stuff, these words, they get all confused. People are like, what is going on? I'm trying to understand with my shoulders. So just educating people on these words, I think is awesome. Yeah, we have all kinds of, unfortunately, we have all kinds of terms in sports medicine yeah. and we name everything. And some are named after uh, former you know, prolific orthopedic surgeons, and, and some are named as uh, pneumon, and some are acronyms. So it, it's a lot to keep up with, but really, if you just. I think your audio is starting to. The, your audio is starting to cut anatomy. out just a little bit. I don't know if that's my internet Can you understand the, the, um, the mechanism of the injury? I think it really helps understand. I just want to make sure. Can everyone comment on the Instagram live? Let us know that audio is good. I just want to know if that's my internet or Dr. Weber's. You don't happen to have a microphone, a headphones, do you, Dr. Weber? Yeah, I've lost the audio. Can you hear me? I think. It's his audio. Let me know if you have headphones and you're able to plug them into uh, your uh, phone. I think that'll, um, we'll see what we can do. All right, we'll pause for one second. I'll go through uh, some of the questions that have come in so far. So what we're going Great. to do is we're going to cover a few more questions that we had planned I before. Do. Can you hear me or no? Yeah, now I can. Now I can hear you. Uh, so I'm going to answer some questions that rolled in before. Um, and then also towards the ends, we're going to prioritize it's my uh, audio. questions rolling in yeah. from the Instagram live. Yeah. And then um, let's see. Oh, someone was not happy that I was wearing a, a yeah. hoodie and a T-shirt. Um, I'm currently home in New Jersey. I'm working from home versus Dr. Weber. He was seeing patients today, so. I hope you don't judge me too much. I, I could have put on a button up, but I would still be wearing shorts. I was definitely better now. Um, okay, cool. So we talked a little bit about that. I think what's a nice transition now is how do you typically treat and manage these injuries? So whether it's the biceps, uh, whether it's the labrum, yeah. whether it's a combination of both, what is your preferred way to manage these? And I know it's a loaded question because it's totally going to depend on the individual, uh, but what yeah. are some of your preferred methods? Maybe what are some of the procedures that you perform? And then we can just go from there. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, it is a loaded question. Yeah. I think, uh, anytime we see athletes with these injuries, uh, we need to understand a few things. One, uh, what's the athlete's level? Are they in season or out of season? Right. Uh, do they have time now to rehab? Do they, you know, do they need a quick fix now? Um, what they've tried so far? Uh, is this their first uh, time seeing a physician for this? Or have they seen someone over and over again? Um, how long they've been dealing with the injury? Um, and then what the injury is. So uh, probably let's start with some of the controversial ones first. Um, if you think about uh, anterior instability of the shoulder, so your typical bank art, shoulder dislocator. Um, the pendulum has swung in both directions over the years. So uh, at first, people were uh, saying, okay, uh, the first time the shoulder comes out, we're going to fix it uh, surgically. Uh, then there's a period of time where uh, we said, everyone's entitled to one shoulder dislocation. Uh, once you have your second, then we start talking about surgical interventions. And now for some athletes, we're uh, thinking it, it may make sense to go back uh, to if it comes out once uh, and you're a contact athlete, 
uh, competitive overhead contact athlete that uh, it may make sense to fix it even after the first dislocation. Um, uh, for the in-season athlete with a shoulder dislocation, we typically reduce the shoulder acutely uh, and then rehab them. So if they can rehab and they have full range of motion and full strength, then we let them back into participation. So I think that's an important thing uh, or a distinction we make with our USC athletes is full range of motion and full strength of an extremity means you can participate. If you don't have full range of motion and full strength, you can't protect yourself or that joint from a further injury or other uh, joints of your body. So you, you may be uh, predisposed to having other injuries. And so uh, we always use that motto, full range of motion, full strength equals participation, full participation. Um, so in, in general, a first time dislocation, uh, whether it's one of our USC athletes or whether it's someone in our, uh, in our office, uh, we typically try to rehab these patients get their full range of motion and strength back, and then get them on the field of uh, a player back to competition. Um, same thing goes for posterior dislocators or even micro instability. So linemen, for example, they don't dislocate the shoulder posteriorly uh, repetitively, but they have what's called micro instability, which means they feel uh, uh, when they're blocking that the shoulder is sliding a little bit or they have pain in the back of the uh, shoulder. And those uh, athletes, again, uh, we, we try to do everything we can to, show, uh, to strengthen the surrounding uh, musculature and allow them to uh, fully participate. Uh, and sometimes in the off season, we talk to those athletes about stabilizing the shoulder. Uh, when it comes to the biceps tendon, um, it gets a little uh, tricky again. Uh, we see lots of asymptomatic athletes who will have an MRI scan done for some other reason, and it will show that there's um, a superior labral tear sometimes even some fraying of the biceps tendon. Uh, we, we typically try to delineate those that are symptomatic from that versus those that just have that as a uh, asymptomatic finding on their MRI scan. So those that are truly symptomatic from a, a superior labral tear or some biceps uh, injury, uh, we typically try a conservative or non-surgical uh, treatment uh, for as long as possible. And, and uh, I know you guys will be talking with the uh, uh, rush guys about PRP, but sometimes uh, we uh, use some biologic injections in the shoulder. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest thing, right, it, it totally depends. Every single person, every single situation is is so unique with the labrum and the, the pendulum's always swinging. I mean, I remember you and I, we were at the USC shoulder update and I believe Dr. Hatch was talking a little bit about it, and it was, it was that rule. Well, okay, there's a there's a really high chance of this happening again. Do we yeah. do we operate now? What do we decide? And I think it's just a case by case thing. And uh, more importantly, I, you talk to certain people, and if it's a baseball player, if it's a pitcher, and they yeah. don't have a labral tear, if they don't have some sort yeah. of labral pathology, then they're probably not a good baseball player. So yeah. I yeah. think it's it all depends on the case. It all depends on the scenario. Uh, yeah. But say that you do decide to operate on someone, uh, tell us a little bit about it. What, what do you typically do? Sure. Uh, a little bit about just the surgery process. Sure. So... Um... Most uh, soft tissue labral tears uh, are fixed with arthroscopic surgery, which means uh, three poke holes around the shoulder, uh, uh, definitely smaller than the tip of the finger. Uh, those poke holes uh, are closed with dis dissolvable sutures, so you don't even have to have sutures removed anymore. Uh, the surgery we do, I liken it almost to sewing a shirt button back to a shirt. Um, so what we do is we uh, mobilize or free up the labrum um, because it typically scars in after it's torn. So we free it up or mobilize it. Uh, and then uh, we use small suture anchors and sutures uh, to uh, anchor that labrum back to the bone uh, in its appropriate position. So what we do, um, for example, here uh, on the model, if the labral tear was in the front of the uh, shoulder here, we would use maybe one, two, three anchors uh, to repair that labrum back to the bone. And we can do that all arthroscopically. Um, uh, it's a really a quick procedure, um, and we can talk a little bit about the rehab as well. Same thing goes for the superior labrum. 
uh, typically uh, restore it back to the bone with uh, suture anchors, uh, two uh, anchors typically uh, for a superior labral tear, uh, posterior labral tear, same thing, uh, anchors back to the bone uh, once we've mobilized the, the labrum. Um, you know, when, when we talk about uh, the overhead throwing athlete and slap tears, uh, there's also been some uh, changes recently where some uh, patients are having more uh, bicep symptoms, and then we do what's called a, a biceps tenodesis uh, rather than uh, repairing. He froze up a little bit. For a second. So yeah. where, you, where you I had back. you left off was biceps tenodesis. Um, yeah. for individuals, especially throwing athletes, if they're having biceps pain. And I'm glad you brought that up because we get lots of questions about biceps tenodesis. And there's a lot of people that don't really know what it is. So here's a perfect time to, yeah. to explain what is biceps tenodesis. Yeah. So I think I'll, I'll go back to the model here. Um, Handy so, model. Yeah. Like I said before, the, the biceps kind of comes, uh, the biceps tendon, long head, um, comes up through this groove and then makes kind of a killer turn and comes into the joint uh, this way and it attaches up here. So what we do is arthroscopically, uh, we can release the biceps from up here where it attaches next to the labrum and then we can uh, re-anchor it uh, to the bone uh, of the humerus. And we can do that in a couple different ways. We can do it arthroscopically uh, up here which means we just make another small poke hole and anchor it to the bone here. We can do it through a small incision in the armpit and anchor it down here uh, below the biceps groove. So this is the biceps groove here. Uh, some people will anchor it up here. Uh, some people choose to anchor it down here. Uh, and that is somewhat surgeon preference. And also whether you believe that the biceps being in this groove here is a generator of pain or a pain generator. So you can imagine if there's a tendon sitting in a groove, when you're doing things like throwing or moving the arm around, there's some propensity for that biceps tendon to kind of slide around in this groove, meaning it kind of windshield wipers back and forth in the groove or, or braids on the groove. So people who believe in anchoring it down here say, listen, I want to get this biceps tendon out of this groove or out of a place where it can kind of slide around and cause pain and anchor it down here, okay? Other people say the groove is not the issue. It's just that it's pulling on the labrum up here. So I'm going to anchor it uh, up here above the groove or in the groove. So that's a uh, surgeon preference. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, dependent on what, uh, uh, this, how the surgeon's trained, what their experience has been, um, how their athletes have responded or patients have responded in the past. What do you like to do? Yeah, so typically I... I um, You'll see when you talk to the rush guys, but I, um, I trained with guys who believe that this groove is a, is a significant source of pain. Uh, uh -huh. So I make a small uh, incision in the armpit and then I kind of tunnel under the uh, pec tendon until I can get over here on the arm and then I anchor it to the bone here. And I, I had saw a number of patients um, when I was in my training uh, who had had either uh, a tenodesis up here or the biceps was left alone intact and on the bone here and they said listen doc uh, I still have pain in the front or the anterior aspect of my shoulder so they point right here and they say doc my pain is kind of right through this area of my shoulder and the minute we uh, take the biceps off of here or release it from where it was tacked down before up here and move it down here uh, the pain goes away in the front of the shoulder so I think it's a really, uh, you know, it's somewhat controversial, but um, sometimes when you, when you take the tendon out or when you do the dissection and you see just how worn and frayed or how inflamed the tendon is, uh, it's, it really will uh, convince you quickly that the groove can be a source of discomfort for patients. And since I have you on here, I think it's really interesting to talk about the groove. Arthroscopically, yeah. maybe in some of those patients that have symptoms, do you see differences in just their anatomical structure of their groove? Is it, is it deeper? Is it more shallow? Is that something that as a surgeon you're considering and you're looking at? Because I think there's actually some questions and some that popped up in this IG Live about it feels like it's slipping. So yeah, for some individuals, were they just, you know, unfortunately born and more 
predisposed to that? Um, yeah. Because I've had people ask that. I've had patients ask. Yeah, so I think definitely there, just like all of us have asymmetries side to side in our anatomy, uh, we also have uh, differences in the morphology of our bones, meaning how our bones develop, uh, and the groove is no different. So some people can have a very deep groove here. So let me see if I can show you. This model has a pretty deep groove here. Uh, some people have a more shallow groove. Um, and uh, that's one thing I really like about doing the tenodesis down here is I've eliminated having to think about uh, what the groove morphology or, or design is. I just know if I get the biceps down here and out of the groove, then uh, the patient's going to do really well. Awesome. So now that we talked a little bit about the surgery, about what you're going to do, depending on the injury itself, um, I think yeah. that was a good time to maybe let's transition to a little bit about the rehab. So what's cool. the average rehab look like? Uh, yeah. is, is rehab for one surgery different than another? What should yeah. an athlete expect versus maybe the average person? Because there's a lot of people that have these surgeries and they're not overhead athletes either. So. I think for the a shoulder dislocator, uh, we can lump them all uh, together. Uh, surgery for the shoulder dislocator and then rehab, uh, typically two weeks in a sling, almost full time between two weeks and four weeks, they're starting to mobilize the shoulder. Uh, at six weeks, they're starting to get their uh, full range of motion back. Um, at three months, so 12 weeks, I let them uh, really start uh, uh, going hard with some strengthening uh, with the goal of between four and a half and six months being uh, cleared for all activities. So uh, typically a six month uh, recovery from, for a, a dislocation, uh, shoulder arthroscopic surgery. Uh, the biceps tendon, when we tenodes it, uh, when someone has a tenodesis, uh, we're typically uh, two weeks uh, in the sling. After they come out of the sling, uh, shoulder mobility as tolerated right away. Uh, so they can get that back in the course of a few weeks if they'd like. And then um, just no active biceps activities uh, for the first six weeks. Again, goal four and a half months back to all activities in the gym. We talked about some of the perks of a biceps tenodesis, especially yeah. related to pain, but I think what we haven't talked about is maybe some of the downfalls if you do a biceps tenodesis, especially because that, that biceps long head inserts on the labrum. And we started the conversation about how it's such a, there's inherent instability to the joint itself. So yeah. when we actually remove that biceps, there's potential loss of uh, some of that dynamic stability. So yeah. I think if you want to touch on that, I think, you know, it'd be cool to hear some of the perks, but also maybe some of the downfalls. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, the long head of the biceps can act as a depressor uh, uh, to the uh, glenohumeral uh, joint or to the ball onto the socket. Uh, so when you release it, you are releasing some of the uh, depression forces uh, for the uh, ball onto the socket. Um, largely when we're doing that surgery, um, if it's an isolated tenodesis, we're not too concerned about uh, that uh, athlete or individual uh, needing their biceps as a, a depressing force. Um, in the older patient, uh, sometimes we're doing it with a rotator cuff tear and we can talk about that uh, uh, in a different segment. But yeah. Um, for these patients, uh, some people think the downside is that you're, you're drilling uh, some hole in the bone down here, and you're altering what we call the length tension relationship of the biceps. So the biceps tendon is, uh, uh, is long. When you tack it down to the bone here, we're removing a lot of the tendon. So it's very important that before we remove that tendon, we make sure that we're maintaining the length tendon relationship of the biceps. So we put it down to the bone here or anchor it to the bone down here now. We need to make sure that the muscle uh, unit, the tendon and muscle, are still working at their maximal uh, normal length and tension. So if we leave too much there, 
too much tendon that's uh, flopping around, we're not getting the appropriate length tension relationship. So that's an important consideration. The other is if you drill a big hole in the bone here, there are some case reports, uh, meaning there are some instances where people have reported that they put a big hole in the bone here and maybe they drill it a little bit too close to here or a little too close to here, not kind of center center in the bone. And then the athlete goes and does something like throw a ball uh, and they have a fracture through the bone. So obviously uh, that's a, a problem and we want to avoid that. And if you use good technique for this, uh, you can avoid that complication. Awesome. Yeah. And I think what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, if with the average healthy shoulder, biceps actually mm -hmm. helps flex the arm. So actually raise the arm. Yeah. And just because you have that handy model, what does the depression of the shoulder look like for some individuals that don't know what that means? Yeah. So what that means is you can imagine the, the um, here with the model, uh, here's the groove. So the biceps kind of comes up and into the joint this way. And so what we have is that it's, it pushes the uh, ball down on the socket rather than having the ball sit kind of up on the socket like this. So it keeps the ball centered on the socket because it, it sits kind of above it uh, this way. Yeah, and I think we just talked about it, how we could easily do even longer than a one-hour video on rotator yeah. cuff. But someone asked, yeah. so Inspire Fitness London, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase it a little bit, but sure. is this why you get pain in the bicep area when you have a tear in the supraspinatus? And I think this is a great understanding of maybe what is like referred pain. Because a lot yeah. of people, especially after rotator cuff uh, surgery or even even shoulder surgery in, in general, a lot of people really point to pain at the deltoid insertion. But they yeah. always say, hey, my pain's here. Or even yeah. after a bicep stenodesis, but I thought the injury was up here. And then people yeah. get really concerned because they, they feel like the pain should be exactly where the procedure was done, where their yeah. marks were, but they're getting pain somewhere else. Why is that? Yeah, so... Um... It brings up a good point. So classically, people who have uh, rotator cuff tears have pain over the outside part of the arm here. Um, so they'll come in and they'll say two things to us with a rotator cuff tear. They'll say, Doc, my pain is over the outside part of my arm here, and it wakes me up at night. Those are two classic findings for rotator cuff tears. And that patient has probably a rotator cuff tear until proven otherwise. So lateral uh, aspect of the arm, pain that wakes me up at, at night in, in the correct patient age, obviously that's not the 20 year old, that's the 50, 60, 70 year old, uh, that's a rotator cuff tear until proven otherwise. Yeah, I and love then, that. And you talked about that in like, a, I believe it was almost, it was over a year ago now, but it's so important with classifying people with what type of injury they're likely to have. And sure. that last point that you brought up that it's, it's for the older individual. So right. for anyone that's tuning in, if you're 18 years old and you have pain on the outside of your arm and it's keeping you up at night and maybe yeah. you had a really tough workout, probably don't have a rotator cuff tear. Okay. You probably just strained something. Um, so that was great. And keep going. I know I interrupted you. Yeah. No, no, no. And, and then uh, to specifically answer uh, this individual's question, uh, the rotator cuff and the biceps are very intimately associated in the sense that um, when – the biceps tendon traverses uh, when it comes through the groove here. The subscapularis tendon of the rotator cuff is right here. So it sits right next to the subscapularis. And then when the biceps comes up on top of the joint, so up here, the supraspinatus tendon is right here. So we think that all of that together um, is kind of working in unison. So when um, the bicep starts sliding around in the groove, uh, back and forth this way, that motion can cause tears in the upper border, so the upper part of the subscapularis tendon here. It can also start fraying on the supraspinatus tendon here. And so it is not uncommon that when you lose constraint of the biceps, uh, you start either tearing the subscapularis or the supraspinatus. It's also not uncommon that as the supraspinatus tendon here starts tearing, uh, that it also starts affecting the restraint uh, or the constraint of the biceps tendon. So the two go hand in hand, which is a really uh, good question by this individual, because oftentimes when we're repairing either the 
uh, supraspinatus or the subscapularis, uh, we're also dealing with the biceps tendon, either with a tenodesis, so anchoring it to the bone here, or sometimes even what's called a tenotomy, which means we uh, cut the tendon and let it uh, retract down the arm. Another really good question came in. I just want to, we can start jumping into some of the live questions and some of the yeah. questions that people had asked the past two days, because there's some really good ones, but we actually covered some of them throughout the intro, so that was good. But athletepro.co asks, what are your favorite special tests when evaluating a shoulder? And I think you can talk yeah. a little bit about in general what you like, or then we can even talk a little bit more about what in the biceps itself. Sure. Um, so things, uh, just the kind of core, or the basic uh, shoulder exam, I think the most important things are first uh, appearance. Do they have any atrophy of the muscles around the, of the rotator cuff? Is there any a gross uh, change from one side to the other in how the muscles around the shoulder look, right? Then we want to uh, look at range of motion. So uh, forward elevation, bringing the arm up overhead. Um, external rotation, rotating the arm out to the side, internal rotation. Uh, these are the uh, core kind of uh, rotations and, and motions of the shoulder. And then uh, we talk about uh, strength testing. So we want to evaluate the supraspinatus, uh, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, uh, and the subscapularis. We want to test the deltoid function. We want to uh, uh, test to see if they have pain along their biceps tendon pain over their acromioclavicular joint or AC joint. Um, so those are uh, uh, kind of the, the workhorse uh, exam maneuvers that we do. We want to know range of motion. We want to know strength. And we want to know if there are point-specific sources of pain. And then from there, we get into some of the special tests uh, for the shoulder uh, that we use to isolate either certain muscles of the rotator cuff, uh, pain uh, from uh, labral tears or biceps pain, and then what we call apprehension, which means if someone's a shoulder dislocator, we can put them into certain positions uh, that will cause them apprehension, which means they start worrying that the shoulder may come out of place. Uh, so for the anterior shoulder dislocator, which is our most common, if we bring the patient into this position where we bring the arm out to the side, as we start to externally rotate uh, the arm, uh, they'll start saying, listen, doc, chill out with that. You're making me nervous. My shoulder's going to come out of place. With the posterior dislocators, we typically uh, lie them down. We'll bring the arm across the front of the body or out in front this way, and then we'll push to uh, see if the ball will slide backwards. So if the uh, ball here kind of slides uh, backwards on the socket, so if they can slide out the back. So... Um, those are the main things uh, that we uh, use as kind of the workhorse exam maneuvers. And then uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know if, um, uh, Craig, you want to talk about some of the special tests as well. Yeah, I think when it, when it comes to the labrum, uh, for the most part, you know, what we learned in school, really how to test the labrum. But for the most part, the patients that I see in the clinic, if it's a labrum issue, more mm -hmm. often than not, they've already seen a doc. They've already seen a physician. Yeah. They've already had imaging done just because a lot of the labral issues that I see is due to a traumatic event. Yeah. Uh, something happened. They clearly felt something pop out. They went to the ER. So there was already imaging done. Uh, but mm -hmm. if I just want to get a better grasp of, okay, well, how stable is this shoulder and really what provokes their pain, what provokes their symptoms. I really like to look at stuff on the table. So yeah. if it's an overhead athlete, okay, I'm going to look at their 90-90 range of motion, that apprehension test uh, that you spoke of. I, I already have my other hand just on that shoulder to feel it as I'm going through the motion with the other hand holding onto the forearm. Um, I'm looking at some of, uh, there's tests called like biceps load one, biceps yeah. load two. Does that cause symptoms? What do I feel at the shoulder? Um, those are some of the, the tests that I really look at. And then, yeah, when's the overhead athlete looking at 
uh, total arc range of motion. So yeah. what's their external rotation? So I'll be here. What's their external yeah. rotation at this point versus here? If I were to look at it from the side, so if I were over that direction looking at my head, I want to be able to get this full total arc range of motion. And then basically, I, I go from there. Um, yep. And I think that sort yeah. of goes right into, uh, you know, okay, well, based on that, based on some of your examinations, uh, what really dictates what are you going to do? So is there something that you test in the clinic, you already feel pretty confident that you would prefer to operate on this person versus what would you say, okay, let's try PT? Yeah, I think in general, um, uh, unless there's a, a fracture, meaning when they dislocated, they've knocked off a good piece of bone here in the front uh, or in the back if they've had a posterior dislocation, um, we're typically starting with non-operative care uh, or non-surgical care. Uh, and uh, the, the key things I want to see are can we get their full range of motion back and can we improve their strength? And um, we haven't really talked much about scapular dyskinesia or how someone moves their shoulder blade, um, but we can talk about that maybe in another um, uh, section. But um, we really just want to get their motion back as soon as possible so they don't get stiff and then increase their strength in a safe way so that um, we can return them to whatever function they want to do, whether that's everyday life, whether that's hiking and riding a bike, or whether that's competitive sports. So first things first, get the motion back, help them get their motion back. So if that's passively first and then moving on to active. Uh, And then uh, from there, go to uh, strengthening the shoulder and the surrounding muscles. Yeah, and I think that's the tricky part, especially for the overhead athlete in some of those early phases. That's why it's so important that first session to just find what really provokes their symptoms. Uh, yeah. Because you've got to get full range of motion back as soon as possible. Ideally, it's yeah. like 95% within the first six weeks, I believe. Um, but some of those areas where you have to get that full range of motion for that athlete, that's where the, yeah. the joint is inherently uh, less stable. So yeah. what I find in rehab, I know that some of the questions that popped up, well, it's like, okay, well, what's the best to do for rehabbing this? Um, especially for someone that has a, they're already apprehensive, they experience a lot of pain. Uh, especially if it was a traumatic event. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's fear associated with getting their arm in a certain position again. So yeah. I yeah. find with those individuals, getting them to participate in moving their arm and then mm -hmm. more importantly, doing it closed chain. So the difference between closed chain is me moving my arm by itself. This is open chain versus if I had my hand against the wall, if I exactly. had my hand against the ground, yeah. moving my body on my arm those individuals, they just tend to do better with that. And you'll see yeah. some interesting things. Um, I, I, had a, I had an individual a couple of weeks ago. No, it was probably like a month ago, strained his shoulder. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even move his arm on the table. No shot. He was not letting me move his arm passively. But the minute that you could let him help move his arm and provide some feedback to that shoulder, he had the range of motion. But you could easily yeah. get tricked by trying to move someone's arm, that's the one tricky thing about a shoulder is that you have to find ways to let the person help move their arm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I think at this point, for any individuals that are tuned in, continue to ask questions. Dr. Weber and I are definitely going to uh, first. Uh, but we also had some questions roll in. 
yeah. I think this is a really interesting question, and I would love to hear your standpoint, but what are some of the common mistakes people should avoid after they have a labral repair surgery? What are some of the things that you've seen through your career and your practice yeah. that, you know, they, they come back in, things aren't going as well, or what have you even had PTs do that you're like, oh, I wish they didn't do that? Yeah, so I think um, when it comes to labral repairs, um, my biggest objective early on is to get motion back, uh, but but do so in a kind of safe, systematic way. So I want to see that over the first six to eight weeks, uh, you're gently increasing motion every time that I see that patient back. Um, the patients that worry me are the ones that come back in two or four weeks and they have full range of motion already. That tells me that maybe I, either I didn't do my job correctly and I didn't tighten the shoulder appropriately, um, or they've maybe been pushing it a little too much in physical therapy. Um, so what I want to see is like a, a nice kind of slow stepwise progression of their range of motion uh, over time. And then I, I tell them, don't worry about the strengthening stuff. When we get to the 12 week mark, that's when I really want them to start strengthening. But really the objective early on is just range of motion. And I think if people kind of have the 12 week mark as a target for full range of motion, and then uh, they go for three months or 12 weeks range of motion, three months or 12 weeks back to full strength. And I, I think as long as everyone's on the same page about that, uh, people do very well. Um, you know, the, the, those that have recurrence of labral tears are typically our contact athletes where um, the shoulder feels stable. They're just putting themselves in a very high-risk position uh, by playing a high-risk sport. Yeah, and I, expectation, right? Expectations right. are everything. 